This video illustrates a CT-guided percutaneous radiofrequency electrode placement into the upper cervical spinal cord through the C1, C2 interspace for ablation of the anterior lateral spinal thalamic tracts for the treatment of cancer-related pain. The spinal thalamic tract transmits nociceptive signals, temperature, and non-discriminative touch from the contralateral side of the body. There is a somatotopic organization of axons within the tract. Fibers entering from rostral and caudal segments are located in the medial and lateral parts of the tract respectively. The spinal thalamic tract terminates in the contralateral VPL and VPM nuclei as well as the intralaminar or central lateral nucleus and posterior complex of the thalamus. The central lateral nucleus is involved in the effective and motivational response to pain, while the lateral thalamic projections are more involved in the sensory and discriminative aspects of pain sensation. This procedure is most commonly utilized in those patients with severe medically intractable cancer pain who have a life expectancy of one to two years. The procedure is best suited for patients with unilateral somatic type pain below the level of C5. Midline pain is not responsive typically to this procedure. Malignancies most commonly treated include mesothelioma and pancose tumors, gastrointestinal carcinomas, and metastatic carcinoma. Rarely it may be utilized for the treatment of non-cancer pain. For example, chordotomy may be useful in the treatment of nociceptive pain related to a hip fracture in a patient who is receiving palliative care. Great caution should be exercised in performing a bilateral high cervical chordotomy due to the risk of Ondine's curse. Outcomes for patients with complete deafferentation may also be worse due to centralization of the pain syndrome. Patients with large intracranial metastases are also at increased risk due to CSF egress through the C12 puncture. The ideal patient should have good pulmonary reserve, though there are not reported complications in patients with impaired pulmonary function. Pulmonary function tests in order to measure their FEV1 and FVC may be considered. The cortical spinal tracts lie dorsal to the spinal thalamic tracts while the ventral spinal cerebellar tracts overlie them laterally. Lesions to the spinal cerebellar or cortical spinal tracts can lead to post-operative ataxia or weakness of the ipsilateral leg. If the lesion is too high, it is possible to cause contralateral leg weakness. Medially lies the autonomic pathways for vasomotor and genital urinary control found in the lateral horn of the gray matter. Lesions here can result in urinary incontinence and hypotension. The most important adjacent structure is the reticulospinal tract found anteromedially to the spinal thalamic tract. Damage here can result in sleep apnea and ondine's curse. This can also occur as the result of reticulospinal tract lesioning in the setting of impaired pulmonary function or if the only functioning lung is on the side being lesioned. It can also occur within the context of a bilateral chordotomy. Bilateral chordotomy is often reserved for bilateral lower extremity pain and involves supraselective lesioning of the superficial and dorsal portion of the spinal cord. Dysesthesias can occur in up to 5% of patients with a neuropathic component to their pain and who are long-term survivors, as well as those who receive large lesions. One important, though rare, and difficult consequence of this procedure is what is called mere pain, which can occur in up to 5% of patients. This is thought to be the result of bilateral pain that is unmasked as a result of the procedure or transmission of the dorsal spinal nerve roots into bilateral spinal thalamic tracts. To perform the procedure, you will need a CT scanner, a radiofrequency device, a 20 gauge needle, and a disposable percutaneous radiofrequency electrode. The procedure is done in the interventional CT sweep. 30 minutes prior to the procedure, a myelogram is performed via lumbar puncture. Afterwards, the patient is placed in the Trendelenburg position to aid in contrast distribution. This is done to better visualize the spinal cord. Alternatively, this can be done after placement of the cannula during the C12 puncture. The procedure is done under local anesthetic with monitored anesthesia care. It is important to provide local anesthesia and light conscious sedation for the initial needle placement. The patient should be woken for test stimulation and lesioning. The patient is positioned supine. 
It is important that the head remain immobilized in a straight and neutral position within the CT gantry. The shoulders, if needed, should be pulled down to ensure access to the neck. The patient is draped and the area around the mastoid tip is prepped in a sterile fashion. CT image acquisition should be parallel and zero gantry with 1 to 1.25 mm slices from the foramen magnum to the inferior portion of C2 with a wide field of vision so as to see the skin. The field of view should be narrowed to avoid dental artifact. Prior to insertion of needle, local anesthetic with 2% lidocaine is infiltrated into the entry point. A 20 gauge spinal needle is inserted into the skin and soft tissue just inferior to the mastoid tip, less than the distance to the dura. Serial CT scans are obtained to confirm appropriate trajectory and estimate additional distance. The trajectory is adjusted as needed as the needle is advanced in the subarachnoid space. Just prior to the puncture of the dura, 2 milliliters of 2% lidocaine may be injected to avoid pain secondary to the C2 ganglion and dura. Once CSF egress is confirmed, a repeat CT scan is obtained to confirm adequate needle placement in the anterior lateral quadrant of the spinal cord contralateral to the painful side. Because of the somatotopic arrangement of the spinal thalamic tract, the needle can be positioned more anteromedially or 2-3 to three millimeters anterior to the dentate ligament for more cervical, thoracic, and arm pain or more posterior laterally, one millimeter anterior to the dentate ligament for pain located in the lumbosacral or leg region. The RF electrode and hub is placed within the spinal needle. The radio frequency electrode is slowly advanced while monitoring impedance. Entry into the spinal cord is signaled once there is a sudden increase to approximately 800 to 1000 ohms. At this time, the patient may experience a brief period of pain. It is not uncommon for the radio frequency electrode to overshoot the intended target secondary to the movement of the spinal cord and the force required to penetrate the pia. The electrode depth may be retracted by adjusting the probe depth on the hub. There is a lot of variability in the location of spinal pathways, especially with anterior cortical spinal pathways, and it is therefore critical to utilize intraoperative monitoring to ensure patient safety and avoid complications. Sensory stimulation at 100 Hz at 0.1 millisecond pulse widths at less than 0.15 volts is performed to confirm appropriate placement. This should give the patient a sense of warm or mild pain on the opposite half of the body in the region of pain. Usually, sensory stimulation can be elicited at less than 0.2 volts. However, in patients with deafferentation, higher amplitudes may be needed up to 0.5 volts. Occasionally, paresthesias cannot be elicited in the area of pain, but rather will be elicited in surrounding somatotopic areas. Adjustment of the RF electrode anterior posteriorly and mediolaterally is needed to confirm optimal electrode placement. If sensory stimulation is not elicited at less than 0.5 volts, the RF electrode should be repositioned more anteromedially for cervical thoracic pain or posteriorly for lumbosacral pain. Motor stimulation at 2 Hz and 0.1 millisecond pulse widths up to 1 volt is performed, at which time there should be no motor response. Ipsilateral neck contractions are commonly seen due to current spread to the anterior horn cells and ventral rootlets. Ipsilateral motor responses at less than 1 volt indicates the electrode is too close to the dorsal cortical spinal tracts and warrants repositioning. Once position is verified, a thermal ablation can be performed at 80 degrees Celsius for 60 seconds. During this portion of the procedure, the patient may elevate the leg ipsilateral to the stimulation but contralateral to the painful side in order to detect subtle changes in motor strength throughout the process. The RF electrode may be adjusted either mediolaterally or anterior posteriorly to create a second lesion at 80 degrees Celsius for 60 seconds. Following lesioning, the patient should not be able to differentiate sharp or dull sensation. Percutaneous cordotomy is a minimally invasive option for the treatment of unilateral intractable somatic cancer pain below the level of C5 in a patient with a 1-2 to two year life expectancy. It can be performed relatively easily in the awake patient and improves the quality of life in a well-selected patient.